Hey guys, it is Wednesday, March the 9th, and another crazy day in the markets, but uh, very green, and hopefully you guys are making profits in this market. Um, past performance is not indicative of future returns if you are watching this live, and um, I am going to share my screen because there's a lot to talk about. Okay, so here is what I'm seeing right now for the S&P 500 names. You can see it's a broad market rally with people spitting out the energy names. And I think the way that people are talking about this is that this is kind of just a reversal after these these companies got probably oversold by quite a lot. And then energy, I, for some reason, I think people think that these were overbought. They're not overbought. Like they're actually returning to the levels before Ukraine went to war. And I just want to go through this a bit. Now, here's the thing. We have a few things that are just going on in the marketplace that I find very quizzical that it would then for these events, but we kind of just have to go with the flow here. We do have CPI coming out bright and early tomorrow morning, and that's going to read really bad inflation. Even if it doesn't read really bad inflation, hold on tight, guys, because we're going to have some pretty bad inflation. Once you see a little bit of of global economic, like what gets imported, what gets exported. It's really not possible that inflation is going to be alleviated. And these are, again, not things that the Fed can impact. And a lot of folks are saying, hey, the Fed is being backed into a corner here. Um, they need to raise rates, et cetera. But actually, because of the nature of what's happening, it's, it's possible that Either people will realize it on the on the Thursday and start talking about it immediately, or it'll take a couple weeks. But if the Fed raises rates and flattens the curve at this particular point in time, given what kind of has to happen, it could actually be quite bad. It could actually be very, very bad. Um, the U.S. is going to have to grow a bunch of other countries out of what has just happened. And I'm going to kind of, it's going to take me a couple days to paint this picture um, for everyone. But um, as I was thinking about it this morning and thinking about like, what probably has to happen. Anyways, let me show you what I'm talking about. The other thing that's going to happen here is the Fed budget deficit. So the first thing I want to talk about is how is war paid for? Now, um, currently, we are doing a bunch of stuff to try to like use economic sanctions to impact Russia. And I'm going to go through that as well. But um, largely speaking, if you look at it, it sounds like Last night, there was a little bit of rally and a benefit because Zelensky seemed to suggest that he might actually concede his NATO position before the short term because he's trying to save face right now versus Russia's like, I never again want to hear about this stupid NATO issue with you specifically. Do you know what I mean? So like he, I think, is trying to concede backwards to, I don't want to hear, I don't want to talk about it this year. And it'll be really interesting to see if Putin is okay with that because in theory, he had said that to Putin a few years back, and that had kind of resolved some things. But then he went again to try to push for NATO this year. So, so that geopolitical situation, it does sound like Zelensky is starting to give a little bit. We'll see how long it takes to rectify what's going on. The second thing is the Crimea region, which is very pro-Russia, um, allowing that to actually have the leadership that is kind of elected. You know, Zelensky is starting to... Um, weaken his stance there. I'm probably saying it a little strangely because sometimes I can't find the words um, exactly. But um, but that's near the Crimea, and 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 um, that is something as well. Now, if that that is the highest probability to resolving this issue quickly is so, on those two issues, which Putin essentially wanted before he entered Ukraine, and now is simply asking for the same thing before he entered Ukraine. Um, you end up with a situation where um, Putin just spent a bunch of money to get exactly what he wanted. <laughs> okay, now how is he going to pay for that precisely? And especially in a world where we have just um, created a bunch of sanctions and probably will not necessarily lift those sanctions. And then how does the Ukraine pay for the massive amount of damage and in, in infrastructure and other things that it's done? And then what is the state of the crops in the Ukraine? So let me, I'm going to try to answer those questions on this episode because um, everything is rallying today, including the VGK, which is a European index. 
Now, I've lightened up on that a bit because it was rallying so aggressively and I was just like, mm, this is momentum. But I will be looking over the next two weeks for places to put it back on. And I'll explain why um, here. But I kind of want to get out of the way a little bit of momentum. And uh, I also want to get out of the way of, op of options expirations. The monthlies do expire next week. And we already have a lot of reasons for things to trade crazy. That's just one more reason for things to trade really crazy. And so as an options trader, you can handle some vol. You can hedge out some vol, but you can't hedge out uh, too many crazy factors of vol without getting knocked over a little bit. So if anything, um, where I can, I'm just going straight to cash and lowering my overall book exposure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some things that I, I still think are a little bit misrepresented in the marketplace, and that's oil imports. Now, I had said yesterday I don't see what people are saying are the oil imports that are so large that uh, oil sanctions would matter. And so I dragged this up from an article that was written like two days ago by The Hill that was talking about oil imports. And The Hill sometimes does actually feed President Biden's knowledge base. And so we imported in 72 million barrels of oil. But what I want you to understand, um, and this is this might be why on my statistics, you know, this number, these numbers vary literally every year, especially if you're one of the smaller nothing players as relates to U.S. oil imports, right? Saudis are going to be, Saudis, Canada, Mexico, those are the ones that matter. Colombia, Ecuador, and Iraq have started to matter a lot as we've normalized relationships with Iraq. And I mean, we got a long way to go because that country really, our relations are touch and go all the time. Um, it's a long history and it's something to consider. But if you're if you're like on that side of it, okay, we are a net exporter. But just for context, 72 million barrels, we use in the United States 20 million barrels a day. We're talking about three days of oil is what we're talking about here, okay? And um, um, yeah, so that's what we import in from Russia. Uh, December imports, by the way, from Russia were 3 million down from 10 million the month prior. So we did even though it was really cold and we had released all our reserves in the month of December, three million is what we what we did with Russia, and that's just a testament to the fact that, like I said, they're not massively important to us from an oil perspective, but they are massively important to Europe in particular. Both this is just oil, uh, not gas. Those numbers were similar, similarly relevant. Um, and then for Europe, that is just not the case. So I also want to show this. These are things that Russia imports, and it's a big number, 238, but they are a net exporter because their export numbers are 400 billion or more. But they, they essentially mostly export to these countries. You can see Europe is a, about 55%. Asia is about 40% with China being this gigantic partner for them. So you know, um, and I'll show you what China is because China is an even bigger, they just have a much bigger market in general, China. And then the United States is only three, about 4% of their GDP. In 2019, this number swung around a little bit. So it may be, that's what I'm saying, 4%. Um, now, this is what Russia exports. And while this may have shifted a little bit, it's not really by much. As you can see, here's this uh, brown color is everything in the energy complex. So it's not just, well, even though we only talk about oil mostly on, because we're really using oil and refined petroleum both together, which is 56% of their exports. We're really using that as a proxy for um, all of the natural resources that it exports, gas, coal, everything here, right? And, it, and coal, which is just the ugliest type of fossil fuel, does oftentimes go to countries that just don't have the money for the technology to upgrade whatever is going on there. Um, it does take time to build these facilities, et cetera, in every country. And in some countries, it's faster. And in some countries, it's slower. And there's a lot, whole mess of reasons for that. Um, then here is metals, right? Metals and chemicals. And the reason they're such a big chemical exporter is just because a lot of the chemicals are made out of uh, out of oil, you know, or alternatively, they're some some weird thing that comes off of oil, you know. So, like for example, um, uh, the ammonia that then creates the nitrogen that is used in fertilizer that comes off of oil, and um, that is part of the reason why they're such a big producer of fertilizer. Anyways, that's in here, and it's also down here. But really, the only things that are not related to commodities are going to be like the smallest part, the green things, because that green things are usually clothing and shoes, stuff like that. Uh, but everything else is either related to food. This is the food. This is also food. 
Um, so, so I really want you to just get a sense that mostly what it's exporting is stuff that will absolutely cause inflation. Okay, <laughs> so, so, and they're exporting it to countries that are that need it. Okay, so even though yes. The EU does produce a lot of wheat. They import in a tremendous amount of wheat, and they also import in most of all this stuff, quite frankly. So, um, if I were to guess, how would Russia do this incursion into Ukraine, resolve it, and not foot the bill? The most likely way they'd do it is to char just charge Europe more for all of this. And so that is part of the reason why I'll wait until everybody chills out. They want to rally. I get it. They're excited that the conflict might be hitting resolution point here in the near term. And then if it gets too hot, closer to the next quarter, we'll kind of see like what the timing is for people to realize that Europe's going to be footing the bill for this one way or the other. Um, and since we only import, here's the U.S. Hold on a second. Let me see. I think this is U.S. Uh, no, it's Ukraine. We're going to get to that next because that's also a problem. Oof. All right, I'll find another time. I think we only import about 4% of our stuff from um, from Russia. So we're not necessarily going to be footing that bill quite the same way. But we do import a lot of stuff from Europe. Uh, we can change it up there because, you know, there's different ways to, to uh, get different products that we might need. But that is why, um, uh, even though I think the U.S. will be a beneficiary given the industry mix that we have, um, the rest of the world will not. Uh, in particular... Uh, Europe. Okay, moving on. Continental Europe. Let me be really specific because the UK may come out of this pretty good because they are a net exporter. Oh my goodness, sorry. They're a net exporter of oil as is Norway. Scandinavia provided it doesn't end up um, joining NATO and just having higher costs as a function of joining NATO could actually end up okay on this too because they are, um, you know, they actually have some things that they export as well um, that are related to the food supply. All right. Okay. So I want to also talk about Ukrainian exports, and this is important because, you know, right, I, I, I think in one of my impassioned moments, <laughs> I might have talked about the fact that the timing of this is really poor because you do have uh, spring planting season. And really, um, just to be clear, the price of wheat has been all over the place, and then some people were like, hey, um, isn't wheat, per when is wheat planted exactly? It is planted. That it is fair. It's it, winter wheat is planted in the in the uh, I'll call it fall months because really, uh, what do we really call winter? It's not going to be planted in January when the ground's frozen. But spring wheat is planted right now, and that is something Ukraine absolutely uh, both plants, exports, and otherwise. And some of the other countries as well in Europe do pr do produce spring wheat. So that whole fertilizer disruption in the Ukraine will decrease the wheat supply, as you can see here. Um, that's a big component of what this country makes. Now, the other thing, and it's it's interesting, um, I, I love this. I should give some love to this website as well. It's called OEC.world. They compile world statistics on what different countries are doing. And even though all the data is from 2019, and honestly, you really need some time for people to vet the data. So even if they produced a 2021 number, you'd have to be like, this is an estimate. Let's compare it to the prior year and see what's up. A little bit of data land advice for you. But... I digress. You'll notice that this is iron ore, gigantic, but all the immediately quick processes related to iron is also the Ukraine. So on the one hand, that's great because the Ukraine will have the iron it needs to rebuild itself. On the other hand, um, that's a massive issue for the rest of the world as it relates to GDP growth or production of any kind of reasonable equipment. So here's the thing. I am almost never long Nucor, and I still am afraid to touch it at these levels, even though, quite frankly, from an earnings basis, it is uh, cheap. I'm going to monitor it a lot if it falls a lot cheaper, but um, I am not necessarily making a call on steel just because iron ore is going to be definitely more expensive come summer, um, or actually right now. And if it hasn't moved, um, that's, uh, that's, that's just the fact that GDP is probably chilling out right now and people aren't necessarily, are probably in the wait and see mode. But, you know, um, steel, I'd always just be careful of. This dynamic could help, it could hurt. But the two input costs to steel are actually this iron price and also um, electricity, which is going up. I mean, can we all agree to that at least, you know? So, 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 um, so, so with Nucor, it's rallying. It could dance all around. It's really going to be about whether or not it can get pricing and whether or not they incorporated enough uh, pricing to compensate for what will necessarily be 
this increase in iron ore price and the increase in electric co electricity costs. Um, you know, so I would be, even though Nucor, you know, you might hear some commentary on it, I'm probably going to, largely speaking, enjoy uh, um, the sidelines on this one and just cheer on whoever is able to make money one way or the other. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show this to you. These, you know, it's also, it's, it's basically selling these two items. I mean, the other stuff is there, but let's call it what it is, really. It's the ag complex plus iron and metals, and to a lesser extent other metals, but really it's iron, um, sold to the EU. So they're going to experience some difficulties, what I'm saying. Um, okay, and then we only take about 2% of good. We don't take very much from Ukraine, so that's not a big event. Again, the United States, beautiful geography and amazing um, diversity in trade partners, with the exception of China. <laughs> the... Uh, Okay, and then Ukrainian imports, you know, they're a net importer of oil, but then they make that all back on the pipeline. Um, China is a, uh, is a big, um, they import a lot from China, et cetera. These are their trade partners, and they import 4% from us, but it's a little bit of a blip. Um, now, I also want to just put this in context. These are um, top um, wheat exporters globally. This comes from this... Uh, this agricultural, I have to figure out the citation on this. It comes from some agriculture um, journal that I sometimes get graphs from, that sort of thing. But this is 2019, so it's changed very little. But it really is, as you can see, always the same folks over and over again in each of the boxes. And, and I think sometimes people don't realize that a little country like Ukraine can actually be meaningful and impactful to, uh, to, to global grain supplies. Um, and I really want people to understand this is Ukraine specifically because Russia's planting areas probably aren't disrupted in any kind of meaningful way. It's just whether or not you, you, the Russia feels like charge a little bit more. Uh, Ukraine, on the other hand, you know, um, it's very hard to farm when you've got missiles flying in the air and tanks going all over the place and people trying to run, run for another country. So it's highly possible that this has been disrupted. Furthermore, you know, if, if you were trying to fertilize your field uh, with Russian uh, fertilizer during this period of time, that probably wouldn't happen. And so, so it's just something to take a look at and be aware of. Um, again, um, let's see. Yeah, that's really what I'm mostly prepared for today. Let me just double check. Oh, yeah. There's one other thing I just really want to mention on China. I'm going to say it one more time, okay? I really do believe that even though, in theory, from the 2019 data, perhaps there's an update to this, China was the third trading partner, so it was not a major trading partner, it was like not a top three trading partner of Europe, China helped Europe manage its inflation during COVID. And the reason I think that is because of this IMF map, plus when I was over there, every single store that would have been the budget type of store had goods in it that were significantly cheaper than America, because uh, I do, oddly enough, when I travel, look for stuff like that. So every single good in Paris that I would have bought in U.S. at the dollar store was cheaper in the um, store, the, the, the same store, like a Tiger or whatever it is that they have over there um, in Paris. And also it was cheaper in Spain. Every single thing. Masks were a dollar. Um, they were not a dollar here in the middle of COVID. I can tell you that. I'm talking about the, the, the good and see, you know, they were, and, and then if you bought in bulk, they were a lot cheaper. Um, you know, the, every single thing was cheaper. I can't even explain it. Um, you know, even kitchen sponges were cheaper. I like literally look item by item. That is the kind of weirdo that I am. <laughs> Sorry guys, I can't help myself. But I'm fairly certain that China helped Europe with its inflation COVID problemo during this period of time. And I really think that is a testament to what they built, which is the Belt and Road Initiative. So, um, you know, continuing to sanction and push China or doing it in any kind of meaningful long-term long -term situation, I don't know that that's the smartest thing to do for Europe. For us, mixed, uh, mixed because, um, you know, this is USA import, imports and origin, and they are 18%. We would love them to be, I, I mean, I personally would love, as an American, I would love to see us diversify even further to some of the other countries in Latin America. It didn't just have to be Mexico and Canada, our closest neighbors to the north and south. 
but China is a big, this is 2019, this number may have shifted down a little bit, so it may be like 16% now or something like that, but they're still a gigantic uh, partner. We we definitely, on the deficit number, showed that we increased our, uh, and have been consistently every year, in, increasing our imports from China. So I think sometimes um, the, um, the drum beats and all of the aggression should be metered with a little bit of thoughtfulness on what it's going to do to the average citizen here on American soil. And um, that is actually all I have prepared. Any questions? Yeah, man, great, great, great information. Um, you know, I think something very important is the yield curve. Yeah. And, and if it inverts, it's, it's predicted the last seven recessions in a row. Well, I'm thinking the reason why why do we have such a flat yield curve? And I think a lot of it has to do with the foreign demand for our long term debt. Yes, it Which, does. I totally agree with that. What else do you think? <laughs> well, it's not necessarily an economic indicator today or this period of time. Right? You mean like it doesn't necessarily indicate that there's weakness long term for America? Is that what you mean? Exactly. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I keep forgetting to mention that. And I've actually been buying this the entire time, so I feel so bad, but there's just so much news flow that I keep forgetting to say this. Now, I mean, I think that we're still going to have a wild ride here for a little bit. And I still think people are not understanding. Oh my gosh, I'm going to feel so sad if I don't have this slide here. Oh no. All right, I'll find that slide in the other presentation. Okay, so you guys know that I have come out more than once on the idea that um, the um, there's a real problem as relates to reserve currency, and that as a result, I'm very bullish Bitcoin. Here, I'm gonna get this up in a second. And I still very much so mean it, but I think this Ukrainian Russia conflict absolutely highlights more than anything how dangerous it is to. Um, not have any exposure to Bitcoin. Do you know what I mean? Because you've got the world's widest, wildest ride happening with currency. And I've said before, if you are a country that is not a reserve currency, you totally are beholden to the reserve currencies and literally whatever they do. But now here's another reason. If you have any kind of conflict with, with one of the major superpowers, um, you might also just not want to, you know, you may want to be a little smart about what you're holding in reserve currency. So this actually comes from um, this wonderful research firm, uh, Refinitiv Data, Data Stream. You know, they have a couple of really interesting charts that I sometimes pull. Um, but this this really is the composition and how it's changed over the years. The U.S. dollars more or less stayed stationary above 60 percent of reserve currency. The euro has, you know, kind of stayed stationary, let's call it. Um, and then you got uh, yen, um, others, which was like Swiss franc, that sort of thing, Singapore dollar, yada, yada. And then China, which is the green bar, has increasingly gotten larger. And it's gotten larger because it has a lot of trading partners and is increasingly um, uh, just someone that people pe people are doing business with to diversify, quite frankly, away from the U.S. Um, you know, if you're, if you're Brazil, you kind of need a lot of different people to feed those mouths so that you don't import in straight away every single thing that happens into in America, both in the way of monetary and fiscal policy. Sometimes it's good to import it in, but sometimes it can be really painful to your domestic economy. Okay, again, very quickly, reserve currency nations can issue, can they like really can do a lot more flexibly with monetary and fiscal policy. If you are not a reserve currency, you 100% will be importing in everybody else's monetary and fiscal policy, and there's not two ways about it. Okay, here's the thing. I just got done with all of this uh, analysis. Hopefully you agree, maybe you don't agree, but let's say you kind of have it in the back of your head that there's gonna be a lot of inflation in Europe. Okay, that is not good for holding, I mean, it could be good for holding European currency, but it kind of depends on how it all plays out, right? So does it play out that the European countries cannot trade with you because they just don't have money to trade with you or does it play out like how precisely does inflation in europe trade uh is, is going to be a strong euro so that it's really easy to sell goods and services in what exactly is going to happen there 
this, the currency FX people still have, they've been really quiet. And, and that's something uh, that you're going to want to think about. Additionally, um, you know, it, it's probably kind of scary for, for you to watch all of this play out on the world stage and think, oh, how fascinating. The thing that America does is it does these massive sanctions all over the world, therefore cutting you out from the money supply. Hmm, do I want 60% of my reserve currency in, in US dollar? <laughs> you know, like that could be another way that you perceive this if you're a nation that is not one of these reserve currencies. Um, another thing could just be like, you kind of just don't want to have euro period because, um, you know, you do still have to buy oil, right? And um, you may not want to buy it with euro as far as that goes. It's, it's really hard to say how it will go, but legitimately calls for something else as a possibility. Um, gold is always a possibility away from these currencies. Bitcoin is always a possibility away from these currencies. Um, I mean, I'm not a trader of Bitcoin. I always suggest that you do it with BITO. It is traded down, as you can see, like when it started to trade up, it got smacked down again. Um, I would say that like at the 20s, you know, since it's going to be very volatile for a little bit, just try to find spots. If you're going to use the options market, go farther back. If you're not going to, I would almost prefer people not use the options market if they're going to do this and just own it small in an IRA account that is not taxable so that they can just enjoy the upward rise if it does so happen and if people get very disgusted with some of these currencies as their only means as countries specifically uh, get concerned about how all of this played out in the currency markets as well as how all of this played out from a reserve currency perspective. Um, but yeah, because a lot of nations are a little bit worried about European debt most likely they would prefer to have the cash flows in U.S. dollars. Uh, the U.S. is probably, as we have talked about even before Ukraine or Russia, much stronger than the rest of the world. Now, it's interesting because the Chinese economic data came out and they reported that as very strong, but I just want to share with you, as per usual, the Euro Chinese data always comes out very strong. You have to look at the Chinese companies to figure out if there's a problem in China as relates to demand and stuff. So that's just like, yeah. So we shall see. Um, I do think that um, from what I saw thus far, I don't think the Chinese economy is at the upper range of its typical growth rate. It's probably at the lower part, um, and all of this disruption hasn't made things any easier. Yeah, one thing China is, I mean, there are a lot of things, but one thing they're not is stupid. Um, they're very prudent. I think they're they, very prudent. I, Right. I think, they, I think they probably bought Russian oil at a huge discount. And yeah. the thing, they met before the Olympics, right? And he probably told Xi Jinping that, hey, I'm about to, I'm about to invade Ukraine. Why don't you buy some oil from us? So, well, you know, at that time, they that, were... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no go ahead. Let's finish that thought. Yeah. Well, I was going to oh. go back to exporting to Europe. If, if China is helping Europe in trade, maybe their inflation is not going to be as bad as you think. Europe, you Europe. mean? Oh, no, yes. because they're going to have to pay for whatever they whatever Russia just did. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's almost no way that Putin doesn't make Europe foot the bill on this. That's what I maybe, but I don't I'm pretty sure that's, you know, uh, right, like. Um, okay, what are they? What's that? What are they importing from China? They're goods. Mm. So it's like. Um, okay. So stuff at the department true. store, apparel, um, a little bit, but China's not a net, really a net exporter of food. They have a lot of demand for food internally, um, and they are net massively a net importer of food. Right. Yeah, so China might be able to sell um, nat gas at its highs, right? Because basically it moved to coal this last year. As, so the odd thing here, let's bring it up again so you can kind of see. Oh no, what did I do? Hold on, let's see. So let me get this slide. China imports, one section. 
I like these visuals because that way if I can't remember something, it's easier for me to, um, to, to, uh, to remember <laughs> and be prompted on what it was I was trying to say. Okay, so this is China, right? So um, as relates to whether or not China, I don't know that Putin was thinking war at all times, China's trying to get more energy into the country. That's just their deal. Um, you know, they have already built, um, yeah, I think they're like the second or th I think third behind France. They've already built like 45 ish, so 40, let's just call it 40 plus or minus five um, nuclear reactors because, and, and you gotta realize they wouldn't have been able to even do that before 2000. So they've really um, put on the hustle to put a, a lot of nuclear reactors on uh, because they actually don't want to pollute the world, quite frankly, as much as otherwise people try to say, but they're not really trying to pollute the, the world. What they're trying to do is um, support very high GDP growth and bring the country into a modern economy uh, because China is a very proud nation. As far as that goes, there's a lot of history, a lot of like uh, stuff that is probably irrelevant to today. That's what they're actually trying to do. As a result, though, they do produce a tremendous amount of oil and gas, but they've got five times the population um, of, of, of other big um, developed countries. And so, you know, they, they import in a lot of oil. You know, like if you add up all these numbers, you're at about 20% of all imports. Um, is that, and then really, um, I've always, I'm always surprised because this is very small. And then just because the notional dollar value, this is 1.5 trillion. So the notional dollar value of like soybeans and stuff like that, of food is, looks cosmetically quite small, but it's just because these other things are a bit more expensive when they're bringing them in. But they are definitely a net importer of food. That's part of the reason why they're in Latin America is, and also Africa. In Africa, in fairness, that's actually about all the precious metals and resources that are there. But really, uh, and that is also the case, they do probably get a bunch of their oil from Brazil, to be fair. But it, really what they're trying to do is shore up food supply at all times, all times. Um, they do produce a bunch of wheat, though. It doesn't matter. Anyways, the point is, um, for China, um, they are excited. The things that they export, and the, you'll see this because Thursday's CPI will come out, and you can see what the components are. Um, China, um, here, let me show you what it exports. Oh, no, did I? Oh, here we go. Okay. So it does export iron, and it does export a lot of random raw materials. Um, but most, and a lot of people don't realize this, but China actually exports a lot of electronics. You know, all these things that we say, um, but China exports a lot of electronics, <laughs> finished goods and services. Um, those are the things that it can help Europe with, the things here. It can't help Europe with food, and it can't help Europe with oil in any kind of meaningful way. As you can see here, oil is not a piece of what they're, what they're letting go of. They, just, they, they need it. <laughs> so since those are gigantic components, and also this metals isn't that big relative to, I mean, it's big because you got to multiply that by 2.5 trillion, but probably won't be enough to help them out of um, the type of inflation that we're talking about here. Yeah, I was thinking an offset, but you know, that's that. that it's a that really small stupid. offset. You, you know, what's really interesting is that one of the areas that did not see a lot of inflation in the US is apparel. The inflation in apparel is really going to happen um, kind of now, actually. But and that just has to do with some of the things that are happening in the cotton market, things like that. But um, but China's really, you know, for the types of houseware goods, things like that, there were minor relative to, I mean, the real places of inflation in the U.S. are semiconductors, um, housing, um, and that's some of the rolled steel things that are happening there, as well as lumber, et cetera, um, and um, food and energy. Food and energy are ginormous components right now um, and throughout last year. Um, so, so the other components that we imported from China, largely speaking, uh, were up a little bit, but it looks more like that map, so single digits, you know, for the year. Cool. Okay, you've been uh, an um, energy bull for a number of months. Yeah. And now you have the spot at say 109, and the, but you have uh, December 23 at 77. Can you? Oh, yeah, I totally forgot. That's a great point. Okay. Yeah. What were I'm you? In that e i mean i don't know you you have highlighted how that makes it makes you even more 
optimistic about the price. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because President Biden keeps coming on and saying, I, it's not my energy policy that's driving up the price of oil and gas. And then commodity traders will come on and CNBC will politely ask them, is that true that it's not his energy? And they'll be like, um, because no one wants to go on record and, you know, saying something about our president, you know, I mean, national television, we could do it on YouTube and maybe it's a smaller audience and it's fine. But, um, you know, they'll be like, um, well, you know what we kind of need to see is, you know, the back end of this curve would be great if it lifted up because, you know, largely speaking, it looks cosmetically or otherwise that the market for energy is telling you that as you go farther back, it becomes less economic to pump oil out of the ground. And they usually blame, which is interesting to me, they usually blame the overproduction experience of 2000, whatever it is, name your favorite period that they, um, that they weren't looking at the forward end of the curve, just looking at spot and overproduced. So they don't blame the causality of what's pushing the curve down. Instead, they blame the historical experience of having ignored the back end of the curve. But we all know what's pushing the back end of the curve down. So of course it's this energy policy. So it's like, it's, it's like interesting to watch how the spin is happening in the marketplace because President Biden would like to blame Putin for the increase, for the failure to produce and also for the rising oil prices. The fact is oil prices have been rising all year. We were already complaining and experiencing lots of problems and very bullish when oil was at 80. Okay, are you gonna blame Putin for oil being at 80? You know, what about when it was at 90 and you guys still weren't at war yet? Right now, this last this last twenty bucks, I'll give it to you. That was Putin, right? But the other, you know, that that was not Putin, my love. You know what I'm saying? If we want to be honest, so the back of the curve has actually increased to right where it was. I find this ironic. Seventy nine bucks. Um, you know, I bet you this comes right back up. And this is really far out, but like we're talking in 2013. These are all now trading at uh, where they really should have been when, um, you know, because of, you know, our, our wonderful president, um, these, when oil was at 80, were trading at 60 and below, making it very difficult. Like we could have increased oil production, but then if anyone around the globe increased it, it would have made it less profitable or it could have driven the back end of the curve down significantly. And so no oil exec is gonna do that because they do actually have to return capital and make profitable decisions on behalf of investors. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that one of the commodity guys on CNBC who I, I do respect, cause he actually, actually trade this as well. <laughs> he's like, well, we might want to like to see him maybe collaborating or coordinating with the energy businesses a bit more and talking about how he can actually make it profitable for them to um, pump more energy out of the ground. We are seeing the back end lift, so maybe it'll just naturally be profitable. Um, but yeah, there's that sort of thing. Here's the thing. Right. If you're talking about said, five years out, that does definitely, oh, sorry, go ahead. You said 13, I think you meant 23. You're right, 23, I don't know. I, you are <laughs> correct, I did mean 23, <laughs> you know, a decade ago. <laughs> I'm so sorry, <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Thank you for correcting me. Oh, um, yeah, so so um, it's, it's really interesting because in fairness, in five years from now, there's been a lot of investment uh, to, um, to really improve um, to improve the fact that we are so reliant as a nation on on oil and gas. It's, it's not great that we are that kind of co country right now. Um, you know, but that that will take some time to integrate in with different pieces every year, hopefully improving the spectrum. That said, if we, we do have also population growth and GDP growth that we're trying to grow as well. And then some of the other industries that we're continuing to grow are somewhat energy intensive. So it's hard to know precisely whether we'll bring enough capacity of energy on um, to actually map uh, the rising, the, the, the capacity we're taking off. Let me say it that way. And I want to remind you that with the exception of nuclear, which in the United States is not an easy um, thing to ever bring on in other countries, you can get it on as fast as five to seven years, but in the United States, I mean, we're talking 50 year projects just to get all the permitting done and everybody to be in the same space that we actually need to get it done. 
So nuclear isn't unfortunately an option. Nuclear, by the way, has the benefit of being the most non-polluting and also by far the most energy um, producing. Um, it, you know, well, I mean, there might be one other form of energy, but none of them have both those characteristics. Um, so, you know, solar is massively inefficient relative to fossil fuel. Um, so you really have to bring on a lot of it to compensate for any fossil fuel, including coal, okay? Um, and so on and so forth. So this back end of the curve being pushed down is not a one year, that's how I feel about it, this trade is only good for one year. It's uh, persistent. And the other thing that is, um, really frustrated energy executives when they're on the call, but I also find it a little bit awkward. The U.S. uses about 10% of its energy source from, comes from coal. And if we didn't have this going on, you could probably replace that out very quickly. Um, I think I have a slide that shows that um, from, this is from uh, Williams. They were showing uh, the relationship, here we go. So they were showing um, natural gas plays a critical role why is the view so strange? Hold on a second. Reduce the view down a little bit here. Okay, maybe you can see this a little better. This is from Williams. Uh, natural gas plays a critical role in reducing emissions. And what they're showing here is the millions of tons of CO2 emissions and then natural gas as a percentage of that power generation. So as gas increases its market share, currently it's, got, it, it's been forced to decline its market share to uh, this percentage. Or oh, sorry, I got that exactly backwards. The blue line is the CO2 emissions. The green line is the market share of gas. And as we've seen, as the market share of gas increases, as soon as I said it, I knew something was wrong with me. Um, but but um, you know, from 25% to 40%, CO2 emissions declined significantly. And this was the trend before uh, this year, and then we just really ate it on the massive increase in that gas prices due to a failure of production, and we ended up going back to coal in some cases. Uh, but we did use a fair amount of that gas, so please, you know, it's just an overall consumption. Anyway, um, the thing that's really interesting, though, is that we could produce more and more nat gas, and hopefully, uh, and in fact, nat gas is getting significantly better at reducing its emissions in a variety of ways, not the least of which is capturing the flare off uh, to at, at the thing and then transferring it into other energy uses. We talked briefly about it being redirected towards uh, Bitcoin mining. Oddly enough, some of the Bitcoin people are so desperate for energy, they're just capping off the flare and using that. It's very fascinating how this will all play out. But the point is, is that uh, we are fantastic nat gas producers. We are the low cost producer of nat gas by a lot, right? EOG came out and they were like, look, this nat gas thing is annoying on the back end of the curve. But what we did do since we made so much money is instead of buying back stock because we don't know what's going to happen in the future, instead of um, returning, we did a $1 special dividend to all shareholders. We're going to go through our unproven reserves and just prove them out and cost out what it would cost so we can make sure that we can be the low cost producer of nat gas because eventually this can't persist forever. And so they are definitely able to produce nat gas at $40, which is amazing. And then they'll just put it in a little pipeline and ship it on out in boats. I have that slide somewhere else, but I, I'll probably take me a second to find it. Um, the, um, the, the thing that's relevant about that is if the real goal of environmentalists was to globally reduce carbon emissions, they would attempt to try to reduce the use of coal all over the world and, uh, and allow for some time for the technologies to evolve and to have enough time for implementation, proof of concept, and all the other things you need to actually um, have it be dependable for people that don't want to be in the dark, literally. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but instead, they've chosen this path of, um, you know, uh, let's rip the bandage off so that everybody just has to figure it out. And that's pushed a lot of the world back onto coal. China is a definite example of that. And it's so unfortunate because honestly, as a low cost producer, America would actually stand to benefit if, if, we, if, if the environmentalists would make it their mission to just do that one thing, which is get the, the, get the world off of coal and put it on nat gas for the near term until such a time as everybody can actually afford the infrastructure that's required for solar. Cool. Okay, one more question. Back to Russia. You yeah. uh, 
you had a slide yesterday and it was so interesting of the uh some members of nato i think one was lithuania the other was anyway oh yeah let me were, show you. yeah I, that was so interesting okay i'm glad it was helpful i said it a little funny and that's because i'm uh, still learning military terms a little bit but this enhanced forward presence there is actually and i will put it on the discord they list exactly how many troops are there what country they're coming from and what specific military equipment is there so because i don't know the names of all the specific military equipment i'll just list it there um, but they're the role of these spots is to just if if um, troops needed advance quickly they would be stationed in these or not state i don't even know if stations the right word they would be located in these areas and there is significant backup we'll call it machinery just to, that i don't mess it up again uh, but this the nato, NATO um, absolutely publishes all this information i'll put a link on the discord and then these red dots are where you have the missile shield so if i'd said that in a massively confusing way it probably was because i was massively confused um yeah so i mean you know no you can't i mean putin might have a um method to his madness so to speak so because he sees estonia latvia lithuania as possible threats why why let ukraine do the same thing is that what he's thinking well okay so estonia latvia lithuania all joined nato i think they had their shot in the 90s to do it and they did it they took it and they ran for it um i've been to estonia they they really don't like the russians as far as that goes because of there's a long history here that's very interesting i think when when stalin i think it was stalin went in and just like literally moved half the estonians um like there's just a really um I think he moved them to Siberia or something like that. It was, it's a really ugly history between these two countries. Belarus and Ukraine, I think, always had a few more uh, folks that, oh, wow, it's frozen up. Um, uh, Belarus and Ukraine are, are, had a few more folks that had a little tighter connection to Russia. Um, but in general, uh, Russia wasn't happy about these three. They just couldn't do very much about it at the time, I think. I mean, I'm not up on all of my history of this region because in fairness, the major region that I studied at college when all this was happening was Asia. Um, so give me a few months or so, give me a few weeks and I'll probably have, have more, on you, more on this for you. Uh, but um, but um, um, from my, th yeah, this is what it looks like. But if, if you're if you're if you're running Russia, if you're in power, I don't yeah. think he, you're he's looking at those three. And he's going, you know, this doesn't look good for us if Ukraine gets NATO also. Yeah, that's correct. And then remember, Georgia, which is down here. Um, hold on, wait, Ukraine. Yeah, you got to go through Russia. So it's like here, I think um, they um, Georgia made a run for it. I think in 2014. And right. Russia did exactly the same thing. So um, it's not, it shouldn't have been shocking to anyone that this is how Russia would feel about it. Agreed. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, it really, it, you know, it, it's, um, it's like any country. Um, it doesn't like folks that have been, I mean, if you look at this, right, this, this is NATO presence in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, NATO it probably has presence in other locations as well, but it's just, this isn't fun because, you know, Russia has been trying to like figure, I, I think, I, I think this is, we got some differences in opinion going on here as far as that goes for sure. If we, if we were trying to be gentle about how to think about how these folks all feel about each other, there's some true differences of opinion, differences of philosophy, what have you. And um, over the years, everybody's made it clear where everybody falls out on these differences of opinions and feelings. So, so you know, this is not enjoyable for uh, someone like Putin to tolerate. I wish that this were not the case and that it was a much more peaceful world. Heck, even China, as much as the world likes to try to, um, you know, polarize against them from time to time and all of the strange things that they do uh, as it relates to human rights and other things that, that really become um, issues there, um, you know, uh, they don't even want to see uh, conflict in this region because, you know, it's just not not uh, good for anyone from a trade perspective, from a de-escalation perspective, all kinds of stuff. Um, but this is someone right, who's been very a, clear. Yeah. A lot of sense. <laughs> when you look at it like that, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it wasn't. Um, it, it's interesting I mean, because. I like the guy, but 
it's tactical. It's not just he's like an evil warmonger. I mean, yeah, he's trying. To, yeah, I don't like the guy, but he's trying to protect his his country. It's not out of nowhere. And interestingly enough, um, whereas you know, you would think a lot of the military blogs, you know, would come out very aggressively. Putin is an idiot or whatever. Um, actually, even as late as um, the first few days coming out. There were many folks that were writing in very, very, um, you know, because because a lot of the um, military blogs are opinion based. Although, man, when you see some of the stuff that they post that is public information, but is very clearly showing how how the strategy should look, um, uh, the military didn't seem to have confusion as to why this was happening, and and in a lot of ways, that's um, it, I was you know even any confusion that I had once I read some of those blog posts that are just straight military opinion. Um, that's kind of where I, I was like, okay, I'm not seeing it wrong. Got it. Any more questions? I, um, you know, I'll, no, I'll no, go. that's fine. <laughs> James is usually here just to listen, but James, you can always type in a question too if you're afraid to talk. <laughs> All right, then we'll end the show here. Thanks again for joining and good luck in this crazy market. Bye guys.